Hello and welcome to Shady Grove Radio. I'm Dan Loggins. This is the day the Lord has made, and this is episode number 57 of Shady Grove Radio from Shady Grove Wesleyan Church in Colfax, North Carolina. And on this episode of Shady Grove Radio... Some of my earliest memories are waiting for Dad to get home so I could go sit in his patrol car and turn on the siren. I don't remember it, but he used to tell one story about me that when I was small, I thought anybody who wore a policeman's uniform was my father. I would often yell out at them, a random policeman, that's my daddy. As you can imagine, that caused some awkward situations for my mom. And my dad had always told me, and Todd, we could go walk anywhere we needed to go. We could go to Dill Street Park or whatever, but we could not cross King Street. Do not cross King Street. Einstein Mike decides he's not in town. I crossed King Street with my buddies there at the Presbyterian Church at Gaston. And right as we crossed the street, walking down Gaston, all of a sudden, woo! He was sitting at that stoplight at King Street and Gaston. I crossed right in front of him, didn't even know. <laughs> I feel like that moment, the last good fight me and Mike got in and uh, Dad made us hug and tell each other we loved each other. The last thing I wanted to do that day was hug him. <laughs> The voices you just heard are that of Pastor Mike Reynolds and Pastor Todd Reynolds, who is the pastor at Shady Grove. They are the two sons of Richard and Cecil Reynolds of Kings Mountain, North Carolina. And Richard Reynolds recently passed away at the age of 76 years old at Shady Grove and around Kings Mountain. They knew him as Chief Reynolds. Richard was the retired police chief of Kings Mountain, where he served that community for over 30 years. After retiring from the Kings Mountain Police Department, Richard continued to serve the citizens of Cleveland County as a deputy of the Cleveland County Sheriff's Department for 15 years. He was a faithful member of First Wesleyan Church of Kings Mountain. His passions were his friendships and fishing around Midway One and Midway Two fishing lakes in Kings Mountain, where he spent quite a bit of time. Most of all, Richard loved and served his family with all he could give. This is part one of a two-part series. Part two will be friends and co-workers who worked with Chief Reynolds. But part one, we're hearing from his two sons, Pastor Todd and Pastor Mike. We're going to join this service in progress. Please join me now by turning to hymn number 242, and let's stand together and sing this great old hymn of the church, Victory in Jesus, hymn number 242. That was dad's favorite hymn. This church 
You're our family. Liz Bolin, where are you at, Liz? I'm going to make you raise your hand. Liz Bolin and her family prayed me and Todd Reynolds into this church. And they brought us here. And then mom and dad started coming. My dad recommitted his life to Jesus. And it is here where my dad is celebrating today. I heard about a mansion in glory. He has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day, which was June the 3rd, I'll sing up there the song of victory. His family was the police department. His family was his church. And his family was this group right here, especially the chosen one. <laughs> you know, you, you, he's talking about parenting. <laughs> and some of us get a lot of affirmation. <clears throat> And some of us get more discipline than affirmation. <laughs> well, as I like to kid Todd, I have, I have the best brother in the world, and I love him to death, but he knows I gouge at him. And bless his heart, he's uh, y'all, your wonderful servants at Shady Grove. I hate y'all in the mission field with him, but good luck, and we're praying for him. <laughs> but with all that said, I was a little bit rebellious one. And Todd always told me the trick. He said, when dad's lips disappear, you need to back up. <laughs> well, I was a little thick-headed. <clears throat> and the rental stubbornness come out quite a bit. And I'll never forget, I was in seventh grade. I was leaving Central School. Well, at the time, it was a sixth and seventh grade school. Some of you are that from Kings Mountain folks. And my dad had always told me, and Todd, we lived on Dillon Street, which isn't very far from here, but dad had always told us we could go walk anywhere we needed to go. We could go to Dill Street Park or whatever, but we could not cross King Street. At the time, King Street was Highway 6, the road running right through town, for those that don't know. Do not cross King Street. It's too dangerous, and that was before the bypass, and you had trucks going through there such on. Long story short... But all my friends were leaving Central School every day, walking down Gaston Street to downtown and going to Griffith Drugstore after school to get a milkshake, get a hamburger, something like that. And I could go to Hardy's, but you don't know, I mean, how many times a Hardy's hamburger is a Hardy's hamburger? I wanted to, Griffith's, I wanted to go to Griffith Drugstore. Well, Daddy went to a conference. It's on a Friday, I'll never forget it. School's about out. Einstein Mike decides he's not in town. I'm headed to the Griffiths Drugstore. I go, I cross King Street with my buddies there at the Presbyterian Church at Gaston. We cross the street. And right as we cross the street, walking down Gaston, all of a sudden, Woo! <laughs> I'm talking to my buddy. I was all excited. I'd made it across King Street. <laughs> and Dad had turned right. He was sitting at that stoplight at King Street and Gaston. I crossed right in front of him, didn't even know. <laughs> Woo! Pulled up there. Didn't say the word, and I was just carrying on with my buddies, and they look, and they're looking at me, and it gets real quiet, and the finger points out and comes like this, and the lips were gone, <laughs> and I remember the words of the chosen one: <laughs> "When the lips disappear, it's going to be a bad day." He put me in the back seat of that police car. 
and he took me home. But he didn't. His words to me were very clear. Do not cross King Street again. When I went to Appalachian State University for college, my, my best buddy at Appalachian's here, Steve Caldea. Where you at? You in here? So he is. There he is. Me and him were taken off somewhere. And what's the name of the street right in the middle of Boone? King Street. <laughs> So I had to call Daddy and ask if I could call King Trust King. I want to share a passage of scripture to for you just real quick, and then I'll be quiet because I know how you get four preachers up here and y'all about like, oh Lord, we're gonna be here all day. But anyway, <clears throat> Revelation 21, 21 is very simple. I'm just going to read this last half of this verse. This is John's vision of what Dad saw on June the 3rd. And the street of the city is pure gold, transparent as glass. And that really is a description of the true King Street. Thank be to God my dad got to witness that because he gave his heart to Jesus. I have the blessing of preaching a lot of funerals as a funeral director and as a celebrant for the funeral homes that I work for. And we always, always like to give a takeaway to remember that person. And I want you to do something for me today, okay? On the back of this service folder, there's a picture of dad. It's him sitting in front of that nice yellow truck Andrew's getting ready to inherit. <laughs> That's his fishing truck. But I took that picture of dad, I went back on my camera and looked, I think it was about four years ago, on the Saturday before Father's Day. He and I were sitting at Midway Lake fishing. Todd was the athlete. Todd was the baseball player. And, and as, as I joked Todd about it, um, Dad loved me just as equally. But we, Dad loved in a different way. But Dad and I's common thing together was fishing. He was my fishing buddy. I had to do exactly like it was, and I was Mikey. I was Mikey up until the, the day I died. Um, you know, I still am Mikey. Yeah. <laughs> but Mikey, Mikey, Mikey. And it aggravated me so bad, but I just love to hear Mikey today. But anyway, I say all that to say, I want you to take that picture. Because I took that picture of Dad reflecting across that water, and he was in his happy place there. Tony and Keith Crawford, they... They, they're such a good Christian folks, and they, Dad and I got to, were good friends of theirs. And but Dad, I took that picture of Dad, and as I saw that, it reminded me of him reflecting on where he where he was going, of those streets of gold. They were as pure pure as glass, and so take that with you, put it someplace special. And the reason not, it's not for dad, but just to remind us that there's a greater place ahead of us that we're looking forward to. Dad, I love you. Love you more than words can ever explain. As much as I'd love to have you back, I know you don't want to come back. You're enjoying the streets of gold. Thank each and every one of you for being here and showing your love and support and care to our family. And especially, we want to thank the Kings Mountain Police Department Honor Guard and Lisa and all our law enforcement, Bud Jim Woodard and James Camp and Terry Lanier and Houston Corn and all those guys that rode the streets with Dad for all those years. Thank you. Thank you for serving with him.
Now the chosen one gets to preach to you. <laughs> I feel like that moment, the last good fight me and Mike got in and uh, Dad made us hug and tell each other we loved each other. The last thing I wanted to do that day was hug him. <laughs> Uh, Dad passed away June 3rd. It may be providential that Dad passed that day. It was Grandma's birthday, uh, his mom's birthday. It's also a little ironic, considering that Dad spent nearly 50 years in law enforcement, and those of you that know my appreciation for Krispy Kreme, that Dad passed away on National Donut Day. <laughs> Today, I heard this morning getting ready, June 18th is National Fishing Day. So, um, my dad was from Kings Mountain, class of 1964, served it all his life and loved it. When we were out of town and people asked us where we were from, we were from Kings Mountain. When people said, where's that? Dad said, well, Charlotte is 30 miles west of Kings Mountain. <laughs> You didn't, we wasn't from Charlotte. We didn't tell people we were from near Charlotte. We were from Kings Mountain. As you know, Dad was a policeman, stayed, kept his certification for nearly 50 years, most of that time serving in the city and then part-time at the county after he retired, spent one week at home and realized he could make money and probably do a little less than sitting at home doing mom's to-do lists. So he went back to work for the county. Being the son of a policeman, as Mike has uh, shared, was not always easy, especially in a small town. It's hard to get away with some things, but it was something I was always proud of, specifically proud to be his son. Some of my earliest memories are waiting for Dad to get home so I could go sit in his patrol car and turn on the siren. <laughs> I don't remember it, but he used to tell one story about me that when I was small, I thought anybody who wore a policeman's uniform was my father. <laughs> I would often yell out at them, at random policemen, that's my daddy. <laughs> As you can imagine, that caused some awkward situations for my mom. So. But the Kings Mountain Police Department will always be dear to our family. Names like Bob Hayes and Johnny Belk and David and Houston Corn and Jackie Barrett and James Camp, they don't mean a lot to a lot of people outside this community. But to our family, they will always be heroes. My dad was not a perfect man. And he would be the first to admit that. There were things growing up that aggravated me to no end about my dad. He was slow and meticulous with certain things. Maybe why he was such a good detective. Dad was a very slow eater. I used to just, just drive me crazy waiting on him at a restaurant to get finish so we could leave and go somewhere and even to this day one thing I cannot stand to do is to keep sitting at the table after we're done. When we're done, let's go. He made a hamburger or fixed something. Everything had to go on it in a certain order and in a certain way and if it didn't go on in a certain order or a certain way then it couldn't be ate and I remember a lot of Saturday mornings. Mom Mom trying to make his eggs. Dad didn't particularly like eggs, but if he ate eggs, they had to be made and fried, but you couldn't break the yolk. And I remember mom throwing many eggs away and saying things she probably didn't want to be said in church because she broke dad's yolk in the egg. When dad was in his prime, Getting ready to go somewhere was worse than waiting on any woman you have ever waited on in your life. That gray hair did not find that place by itself. It took meticulous work to get it there. 
He was slow and meticulous in so many things and not very spontaneous until mom and dad's very best friends, Jerry and Becky White, got involved. And when it was Jerry and Becky, no telling what would happen. They played cards till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. The kids would be asleep in the living room. They'd wake us up, and we thought we were going home, but no, we're going to the beach. And we're like, okay. Or they would play cards until midnight, and then we'd go midnight bowling. There was no telling what was going to happen when they were involved. Dad could have a temper. He was usually quick to apologize after losing his temper. And I often told him, especially when I got older and didn't live in the house anymore, if he would catch it before he lost it, he wouldn't have to apologize so much. <laughs> but I usually did that over the phone. <laughs> and I don't know that I am the chosen one or was less rebellious than Mike. I just think I was better at getting away with it. <laughs> A little sneakier uh, and a little bit more observant because I was the first to notice, Mike, when the lips disappear, tread carefully, the fuse is about to blow. One thing you did not want to do is wake Dad up from a nap. Family legend has it that one day when he was asleep and we were little living uptown and he was on the couch and front door was open there and this back in the day of salesmen and stuff that came by the house. One Saturday afternoon, man in his suit knocked on the door, woke Dad up. Dad jumped up, went to the door, run the salesman off, told him not to come back. And then that night at supper, my grandma, mom's mom, lived with us then, was sitting there, and all of a sudden she asked, Richard, did my preacher come by today? <laughs> I always remember that when I go on visitation now because I thought, someday I'm going to run into my dad. So, dad loved his Ford Mustangs. I think through the years he had about 15 or 18 of them. He could tell you every one, the color, what year he bought it, even the one that he bought twice. He could tell you everything about them. My favorite was a white convertible he bought in 1988, just before my senior year in high school. And because he leased it on a three-year lease and a 36,000 miles, Mom was working in Gastonia, so he told me I could drive it to high school. We lived like two miles from the high school. I didn't want Dad to teach me how to drive a straight drive because I didn't think that would be good for our relationship, so Kevin actually taught me how to drive it here in the church parking lot. And I thought I was the bomb in that white Mustang. Little did Dad know that would be the year that I met Michelle. And Michelle lived in Asheville. And at the end of my senior year, when I gave Dad the keys back to his Ford Mustang, it had 27,000 miles on it. <laughs> he had two years left to go on his lease. <laughs> he didn't say much, but he's probably still been paying on that lease. <laughs> few lessons that dad taught me that I will cherish forever. First of all is that family is most important. Dad was always there for us. He loved us, especially, now Mike says I'm the chosen ones, but the chosen ones are the grandkids. And there was nothing they could do that was wrong and he was super proud of them. And he and Mom were married for 57 years, showing me and Mike an example of faithfulness and love. My dad taught me about transformation and change. Don't want to get into it, but... I don't know what it was like for him and Chris growing up. I loved my grandfather, but my grandfather struggled with alcohol. And because of that, Dad hardly, I don't ever remember touching it, absolutely hated it, would not allow it in his house. But Dad taught me that chains can be broken and lives can be changed because he broke a family curse and it wouldn't be long before he helped Grandpa break that family curse. 
But I think one of the things I'll always remember about my dad and the greatest lesson he taught me is to always be there. There's not a moment in my life that I don't remember my dad being there. When I was about three or four years old, I was out in the field playing and I somehow cut my knee wide open and Mike got me into the house. Mom happened to be on the phone with Dad. She hung up on him, didn't tell him what was going on, got me to the hospital, but somehow when we got there, Dad beat us there. He was there. One time Dad took me fishing. I was actually having a good time, but we were out on the river and we were out on a dock and a pier and I was leaning over the pier just trying to catch a little brim or whatever that was right there and didn't know it, but there was a wasp nest under it. And I stirred up the wasp accidentally and they come up swarming and Dad is allergic to bees, but somehow he got me out of that. I got stung 10, 12 times. He didn't get stung at all. I don't know how he did that, but he was there. <coughs> When I was a kid and jumped into the deep end of the pool before I could swim, it was Dad who jumped in and got me out. When I was at sixth grade and we had a bomb threat, and they were clearing out Central School and we were all getting out of the school and here come the police and the firemen, I looked across the field and there was my dad. When I was a senior in high school and met Michelle who lived in Asheville, he didn't tell me she lives too far away, didn't tell me I was crazy, but two weeks later he took me on my first date to see her. Part of the reason was we were going to see Mike at Camp Tacoa and the only reason I'd go see her is if I got to go see Michelle in Asheville. <laughs> so, so I don't want to go see him. What do I want to go see him for? <laughs> so. I said, how far is Asheville from Hendersonville? Dad said, 20 minutes. I said, can we go by? He said, yeah. I said, all right. When I got married, he was my best man. When we had Andrew, Michelle went into seizures in the middle of the night. Before I called 911, I called my mom and dad. And they got there before 911. At every birthday party, every graduation, every church I've ever served, he has been there. When I came to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was 12 or 13 years old, what drew me to Christ was a promise. It's in Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord Himself goes before you and He will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And that idea of having someone who was always with me that would never leave me, never forsake me, struck my heart. And the greatest thing my dad taught me. Now dad would say he didn't teach me a lot of spiritual things and sometimes he was intimidated because I was a pastor and he wasn't that he could pass along spiritual things. But he taught me a lesson that changed my life for all of eternity. And that is I have a heavenly father who is always with me. And I know that because I have an earthly father who demonstrated it. For his life and his legacy to God be the glory, and I am eternally great. We have been honoring and remembering the life of Richard Reynolds, Chief Reynolds, known in Kings Mountain, the father of Pastor Todd Reynolds and Pastor Mike Reynolds. This has been part one of a two-part series. Join us next week. We'll have part two. We'll be talking with some co-workers and some friends of Richard Reynolds. Thanks so much for joining us on Shady Grove Radio. Mm -hmm.